Hello, everyone. I see it's noon and we have 60 people logged on. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time and get us started. I'm Chris Benko. I'm the CEO of Connexa Health. Um, thank you for taking the time to join this webinar and a special thank you to our three speakers uh, for making the time to share their perspectives on this incredibly important topic. I'm pleased today that we have my friends and sometimes colleagues and collaborators, Dr. John Wagner of Foresight Capital, Dr. Elena Ismailova, who's the Chief Scientific Officer at Conexa Health, and Andy Korovos, the CEO and co-founder, CEO and founder of Electro Labs. Um, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to be our first speaker, who will open it up um, by sharing his perspectives on the landscape. So, John, if you could unmute and take it from here, thank you. Thanks, th th thanks, Chris. And uh, if if I could have the slide, uh, yeah, slide four, perfect. Thanks very much. So, so I have the the the, I, I guess the the somewhat dubious privilege of of introducing the, the 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 crisis, which is known to to all of us right right now, and it probably goes without saying that we um, we're, we're the the COVID nineteen pandemic is completely transforming the, the, the clinical landscape. Now, we're, we're not gonna talk about the, the radical changes to the, the clinical and the hospital uh, care right, right now, uh, but anyone that's tuned into a, a newspaper um, or website, uh, web, web news, would realize um, how, uh, how, how remarkable the, the world has, has shifted in, in just a, a few short weeks. Um, Relevant to this discussion, um, uh, on a personal uh, note, uh, yesterday, uh, for the first time, I, I helped my 97-year-old mother with a virtual uh, a cardiologist visit um, using some um, wearable devices to, to help her uh, transmit data to, um, to, to her clinician. Um, and the way I think about it is if she can do it, everyone can do it, right? right? It's, a, it's the dawning of a, of a new era here. Um, but um, for the, the clinical trial enterprise, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, sobering uh, headlines and uh, press releases and, and announcements uh, with regard to uh, clinical trials that aren't launching, um, uh, uh, drug launches that are being delayed, um, and generally a, a very serious Im impact on the uh, biopharmaceutical enterprise. And all therapeutic areas uh, are are um, are impacted by by these um, uh, th these events. Oncology uh, is a little bit spare, but but not uh, but not completely spare. And the um, uh, and on kind of an up note, uh, the, the COVID nineteen trials themselves, clinical trials, are proliferating, and there's just a, a, an amazing uh, a spirit of collaboration uh, amongst. Um, um, biotech and, and pharmaceuticals and, and universities right now. Could you hit the next slide, please? And uh, re recognizing these dire circumstances, the, the, um, um, the FDA and the EMA have um, uh, adjusted some of their, their practices in, in very critical wet ways right, right, right now. Um, it's, it's clear that the, uh, the, the pandemic is preventing um, some trial participants from coming to investigational sites. And uh, with, with that in mind, the, the FDA, um, I'll focus on the FDA uh, has been, uh, but it also applies to the EMA, has been very uh, flexible um, with regard to uh, alternative uh, um, arrangements uh, for safety assessments and, and other necessary procedures in, in ongoing clinical trials, and uh, including virtual visits. Uh, and uh, that, that's the subject of, of uh, one recent guidance. And, this, and another guidance was, was actually uh, completely focused on, on non-invasive remote mo monitoring. And in, in that uh, um, guidance, uh, which um, was also very recently re released. The, uh, the the FDA recommended the expansion of the availability and capability of remote patient monitoring devices, and um, and and really expects that increased use utilization of of that remote patient monitoring 
to ease burdens on, on hospitals and, and healthcare facilities. And also, uh, importantly, uh, prevent um, patients, clinical trial participants, from having to expose themselves to um, other risk for, for COVID-19 uh, in infection. And uh, th these, are, um, th these are, are issues that are um, caveated by uh, um, the intention of remaining in effect during the duration of this emergency. But it really is opening a, a door to a, a, a new way of, of, of thinking about uh, um, monitoring in these trials, a, door, uh, a methodology that's existed before, but is going to necessarily be more increasingly utilized. So, so with that, let me hand it over to uh, uh, Elena to, to take us deeper into the topic. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, the next slide, please. The topic of the conversation today is largely devoted to the remote monitoring. And there are several aspects of uh, remote uh, monitoring. Um, the previous slide, please. Um, it could be done in the context of clinical trials, uh, the way how John explained to us why it's important. It can be done um, by means of telehealth. Again, I'm going back to John and experience, his uh, experience of telemedicine um, as, he, uh, as his mom had her remote visit with uh, her treating cardiologist and also in the domain of public surveillance. Here I have um, the heat map uh, produced by the company called uh, Kinza that uh, manufactures a digital uh, thermometer and shows the um, temperature across uh, the United States. However, the focus of the webinar today is remote measurements in clinical trials. The next slide, please. <clears throat> As we've heard, um, the both FDA and EMEA issued uh, guidance are urging uh, to move uh, some of the in-clinic visits into a remote mode. It's done to protect uh, clinical trial participants. As we know from the experience in Italy that in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, some of the hospitals can become epicenters of the uh, infection. Many clinical trial participants have underlying conditions that makes uh, them at risk of having worse outcomes if they become infected and the infection in these populations needs to be um, considered uh, the chance of infections in these populations needs to be considered very carefully and all protective measures uh, needs uh, to be done. Um, additionally, um, putting on hold or suspending clinical trials at this point is not an option because many patients depend uh, on, on uh, experimental medicine for their medical conditions and discontinuing uh, visits in clinical trials will deprive of much needed treatment options. If we are talking about um, digital measurements and digital endpoints in the context of clinical trials that can be done remotely. There are two large buckets, um, like in any clinical trials, the measurements related to efficacy and measurements related to safety. Some of the example of the efficacy measurements um, I have here, for instance, in respiratory diseases like asthma and um, COPD, pulmonary function test, and specifically FEV1 forced expiratory volume in one second is a really important uh, 
outcome uh, measurement. And it can be done remotely. Here I have the picture of a handheld spirometer. It's a small device that can, patients can bring home or it can be shipped to their home. And patients can use it with a prompt of um, an app that will guide them through the uh, procedures and they completely can do this test at home. The, uh, the mobile spirometer connects with the phone app and transmits the data. Additionally, the app has some features that um, can do the first task you see on the data and asks people to repeat the uh, exhalation maneuver if the data is of insufficient quality. The other example is six minute walk test. It is an important functional test usually performed um, in the clinic of uh, physical capacity. And it has been used uh, for clinical trials across a number of therapeutic areas, um, uh, both uh, respiratory diseases and also muscle skeletal disorders. And in some settings, it works reasonably well. I have a graph here that shows the prognostic uh, value of um, six minute walk test uh, in patients with um, cystic fibrosis in terms of predictive value of lung transplant or death. The safety bucket is a very interesting one because it changes in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. A number of measurements can be taken remotely and they include um, body temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate measurements. They can be done at predefined time points. Usually this is how it's stipulated in clinical trial protocols, or they can be done continuously that provides an interesting and rich um, data. We had um, a collaboration with Takeda where we deployed a number of devices that can take these um, continuous vital sign measurements. And here I have the graph of diurnal variation uh, pattern at the aggregate population level. And the data uh, at the aggregate level makes sense and follows the patterns described in the literature. The next slide, please. Before I delve um, into the uh, specific matters uh, concerning devices and measurements, I would like to take a brief excursion into some of the regulatory questions. I created this and the next slide uh, on a prompt from um, Andy Korovas, whom I have uh, a pleasure to have as a co-presenter today. She is uh, my uh, colleague um, from Digital Medicine Society and a co-founder and also a person whom I greatly admire. So Andy urged me to talk a little bit about some of quite common misconceptions um, of uh, around which devices can be used in clinical trials. One of these misconceptions that I hear uh, quite often in my line of work is that only devices that have the endorsement from the FDA in the form 510K um, or PMA can be used um, in uh, clinical trials. Let's look into this. The devices that have 510K clearance or have 510K status or 510K DNO or PMA pre-market authorizations, I intended to provide a regulatory path for medical devices to be legally marketed in the US. For medical devices, uh, device manufacturers have to comply with certain laws and these paths are designated to make sure it's, it's happening. 
No device is cleared for purpose of use in clinical trials. If you look for a device legally marketed in the US, you will find important information on the device intended to use and indications of use. Intended to use specify intended use specifies the populations and indications. In the context of clinical trials, the, the regulatory is a biomarker qualification or drug be used in clinical trials irrespective of um, their regulatory status. What is key here is uh, evidence about device performance and their utility. The next slide, please. Here I'm showing the regulatory framework for, for uh, biomarker qualification evidentiary criteria. And I would like to spend a few minutes here. I find this framework extremely useful and I use it quite often for projects uh, I'm working on because it's a really good way to uh, organize information available, thinking and Id identify the gaps. It starts with a need assessment and basically answers the question what need the device use is trying to address as opposing here we have a technology, let's see where we can apply it. The context use is very important because it identifies biomarker category, if it's um, efficacy or pharmacodynamic or safety, and propose what is supposed to do in the context of clinical trials. Then it goes into benefit and risk to make sure that the balance between the two is correct, which, and the total package leads to the evidence to support qualification that includes biological rationale, data that supports the relationship between biomarker and clinical outcome of interest, and also analytical performance to make sure that the measurements uh, are correct and can be trusted. The next slide, please. I took this table from uh, one of the recent FDA guidance uh, for COVID-19. And um, this guidance is intended to help device manufacturers to uh, be more flexible when uh, modifications to certain devices um, to be used in COVID-19 are required to be filed to the FDA and, what, uh, and when they are not. This table summarizes extremely well the list of devices that people may consider using in um, the context of COVID-19 and it's largely around vital sign measurements. For the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk mostly about the devices and measurements for vital signs that right now are uh, probably the top of the list and is on everyone's mind. And you often see the information about these measurements and devices in the news. The next slide, please. So let's look specifically at the physiological uh, measurements that one can consider to put in the uh, clinical trial as a safety measurements. Of course, the top of the list is a body temperature. Everyone knows that um, uh, the first, usually the first uh, symptom of COVID-19 infection is elevated uh, body temperature. There are a number of thermometers available that give a single number that is relatively easy to interpret. Blood oxygenation is another important one because it has been shown to decrease in association with infection. 
The recent study from Wuhan when doctors measured SpO2 uh, for patients who were admitted to the hospital with coronavirus infection indicated that people who had SpO2 below 90% were usually older in age and also had uh, worse outcomes in terms of symptom severity or even death. Resting heart rate and respiratory rate and other important physiological measurements, especially resting heart rate. The recent paper from the Scripps Institute that has been collecting this data from uh, Fitbit uh, devices at the nationwide level indicated that the amount of in that uh, heart, resting heart rate adds uh, good information to the surveillance of flu incidents um, in the United States. Here I took a liberty of adding one more measurement, which is mobility. And um, one of the mobility variables can be um, expressed in step counts. Uh, can be done through uh, a number of fitness trackers, even though it's not uh, conventional safety measurements. It has been shown in a number of studies that people are slowing down before they come up with uh, some uh, serious health conditions or before they get hospitalized. It has been shown in asthma. It has been shown in COPD. And um, the work from the Montefiore Hospital had shown that uh, measuring daily step counts can be a good dynamic predictor of uh, hospitalization for patients who undergo chemoradiotherapy. The next slide, please. Let's look a little bit um, in depth uh, into some of these measurements. And I will start with uh, body temperature. And what I'm going to do here is to apply the uh, biomarker qualification evidentiary framework as we are considering uh, different body temperature measurements. The more conventional way is to do regular spot check with digital thermometers measuring uh, body temperature. The old-fashioned um, mercury-based thermometers are out of use because they present a hazard. And we have um, the next generation of nice digital thermometers that are much safer to use. The reference range and reference interval, so the whole uh, physiological range of how the human body temperature numbers could be, and also uh, what is uh, normal and what is outside of norm are very well established. It is a straightforward interpretation. The challenge in the remote setting is that people may forget to do the body temperature measurement. And um, the uh, time interval between the management measurement because of that can be fairly large. If people become sick, the first question, how long did you have the symptoms? When have you noticed uh, your body temperature being elevated? Which is an important information for a doctor to determine uh, what is a prognosis for these patients and uh, guide treatment, whether this is a care management or safety uh, issue in a uh, clinical trial. And if the measurements are not done frequently enough, uh, the doctor will rely on patient recall, uh, which is not the most reliable um, information. There are out a number of devices out there that can do continuous body temperature measurements in different uh, parts of the body. It can be done um, as a skin temperature with a device that I have here on the slide. And it's one of the sensors in um, coupled with a single lead ECG 
uh, patch that can measure the skin temperature in on the chest uh, wall. The uh, it is um, an unmet need to have more frequent or continuous measurements that definitely would be beneficial um, as it will provide uh, the rich uh, data sets and the context or views here would be um, continuous uh, monitoring in people who have uh, the infection or are at risk of um, infection. Let's look um, at the data that we have today for this continuous uh, measurement in the auxiliary. The placement, as I said, can be on the chest, on the forehead, and very commonly in the armpit because this is more sheltered uh, space and the measurement can be uh, less variable. One of the way to establish analytical validity of a certain measurements is to compare them to the conventional measurements, which in this case would be the measurement in the body cavity. Most often it's um, the oral cavity. The unfortunate thing that is there is no correlation between uh, uh, auxiliary measurements or uh, and measurements in the body cavity as shown here in two uh, graphs because the auxiliary measurement data is quite variable and the uh, range of values is relatively narrow which makes a really poor correlation no there is good agreement by bland altman analysis the graph on the left, uh, on the right, I'm sorry, shows you the um, continuous monitoring uh, of a temperature on individuals that wears a small patch under their armpit. And this person is uh, sick with uh, some respiratory infection. You can see that in early uh, days when um, the body temperature doesn't seem to be markedly elevated, there is a great deal of variation of the temperature through the day and then the temperature is spiking, which tells us um, looking at these data that uh, standard reference ranges and reference intervals uh, are not copy and paste here and need to be interpreted carefully, um, which, may require informative norm, uh, which may require normative studies. And this informs what needs to be in the qualification package. The next slide, please. Um, let's look um, at other measurements and which devices are available in these context. The other important measure is um, blood um, oxygenation. The conventional uh, way to do it, again, it's a spot check at predefined time on fingertip, um, uh, toe in the case of infants, or earlobe, uh, where tissue is highly vascularized. There are also some continuous uh, SpO2 monitors. Uh, some of them exist in fitness trackers. Some of them are um, in medical grade devices. These values have the same um, issues as I described uh, for the thermometers, spot check versus continuous because they're usually worn on the wrist. This is not the most uh, vascularized tissue and the values can fluctuate from time to time. Additionally, there are motion artifacts and the uh, readout can be affected by bright light. Resting heart rate. One can do it using uh, wearable ECG devices that are designed to for detection and classification of cardiac events, which in this setting may be an overkill they might be too cumbersome for continuous monitoring for extended period of times because some people may have skin reactions to that. The photophlesmisography methods, um, abbreviated PPG, 
can be a good alternative because these um, sensors are embedded in multiple uh, fitness trackers. And some of these trackers like Apple Watch have been shown to have fairly good accuracy concerning the, uh, based on the recent publication from the Duke University. Also, they can be combined with SpO2 measurements if uh, done at predefined time points at fingertip because it allows measurements of heart rate and blood oxygenation at the same time. And again, uh, mobility and step counts can be done with a number of uh, fitness uh, tracking devices and consumer grade uh, devices can be completely appropriate here. I'm going to stop here and um, introduce Andy Korovas, who will continue our presentation. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to post a couple slides and links so that you can get them. So I'm going to post three things into the chat, but I very much encourage you to do uh, the Q&A session. First is a set of slides. Uh, second, and I'll talk more about the Digital Medicine Society and Point Library. And then there's a book on digital medicine uh, that's free that I launched today on Carger. And then you're welcome to message me on Twitter if anybody has any questions. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so just a quick background on me. I, I run a company called Electro Labs, and I'm also a collaborator um, at Harvard MIT for regulatory sciences. And then I am an advisor for the Biohacking Village at DEF CON, which is a security research community. And I previously served at the FDA in the digital health unit. So what, what I'm gonna go through is I'll go through a couple things to reiterate a few of the major points that Elena um, had talked through so that we're all on the same page and seeing what, um, what are some of the main things that are happening in our industry. And then I'll go through ways that you can think about tool selection. So first is a chart that was designed by Evidation Health, which is one of my favorites, which is why we're all here really. Um, I think many of us are interested in collecting these decentralized data at home um, and you're really able to collect a lot more information than what you traditionally are able to collect within the clinic and i sent a link so everybody can go to this and and elena had also mentioned this one of the most common misperceptions is that you need to have an fda cleared product um, like a 510k or de novo to use it in a registered clinical trial you do not and FDA officials have said this multiple times over. I wish we had the emojis where people could either uh, acknowledge whether or not this was a perception that you had or not, or whether you still don't believe me, but you're welcome to reach out afterwards. Um, many times people ask, are people even collecting these digital data? Is this just something that's happening in uh, conferences or is this really something that people are doing to support primary and secondary submissions? And the Digital Medicine Society, which is a 501c3 nonprofit, got a number of groups together to um, work on these sorts of different types and report whether or not they've done a primary or secondary claim um, using a digitally collected sensor. And just for fun, Adam, I'm actually wondering, can people share in the chat? We have so many people on here. I'm actually wondering if people could talk about whether or not their teams have done one. Is that possible? Maybe. Okay, so if, if the chat is open to you and while I'm in present mode, I can't see the chat, um, I'd love to hear from the audience of whether or not your team has submitted a primary or secondary endpoint digitally and bonus points if you have the clinicaltrials.gov link to share it in the chat. I'm gonna keep moving forward. Oh, we got, we got one, first one going. Wonderful. Okay, so for people who have been thinking through, how do I collect a sensor, um, collect measurements digitally? Um, and you'll notice I intentionally do not use the term device, though colloquially many people might use that. We recently published a piece in Nature Digital Medicine on how to think through a framework around what you might consider. 
So there'll be five things and I'll go through a couple examples for each of these. So the first one is around verification, analytical validation and clinical validation. Second is around the security of the product. Third, data rights and governance. Fourth, usability and utility. And then fifth, economic feasibility, which you can loosely think about as cost. So, let's see. Um, for the first one around V3, and there's a paper also coming out shortly that has been confirmed in Nature Digital Medicine is in um, typesetting. The way that you can think about um, whether or not you wanna use these tools is to first think through where you might source different types of evidence. And so evidence might look like peer review papers, it might look like clinicaltrials.gov. In some instances, it might be regulatory decisions, though as many people note, um, not all regulatory decisions, especially ones that may have a predicate, may not have robust clinical data associated with them. And so, um, and especially with how slow peer review studies might be to get published, uh, given how fast technologies are changing, there might be white papers or other sources of evidence that you may want to look at and review. And when you're thinking about the evidence, I would highly encourage you to think about three things. So many people have heard about verification or validation. And when you have pieces of hardware and software, it's super important to think about each of the different steps. So this will be a crude uh, way of thinking about it. But um, so for this product that I have here, verification is really thinking more about the physical hardware components to it and some of the software. So does this uh, sample at the same rate? If I drop it, does it register something on the accelerometer? Analytical validation would be loosely, if I wear this product and I walk 100 steps, does it plus or minus in certain range of evidence um, measure 100 steps? And then clinical validation would be, does 100 steps mean something for me? And so as you go through the different types of process, you can imagine that there are different things that you would need as evidence to go through that, that level. Second is around security. So any of these products that are connected to the internet, it's not if they get hacked, but more when. And there, um, it's much more fun for me when uh, you have a little bit more interaction, but I'd be curious how many people know about what DEF CON is. And DEF CON is one of the biggest security research communities in the world. Um, it, you might have heard about it where last year, or two years ago, I think they had bought a bunch of different, um, a bunch of people at DEF CON bought voting machines and then they were able to hack the product and look at the different types of voting that people did um, across the country and they sent that to Congress. There have been a number of people now who are looking at pacemakers, blood infusion pumps, other sorts of connected products and um, a number of people at DEF CON have now collaborate with the FDA, which is very exciting. And the FDA has started to attend DEF CON as an event. And so over the last couple of years, the FDA has hired a number of different security researchers and white hat hackers into the agency to work on connected um, products and thinking through pre and post market submissions around how you would have safe and secure products. And happy to talk to you more about this. And frankly, this is how I got involved in working at the FDA through um, collaborations and work that I had done through DEF CON. So as you think about this, a couple main things, and um, I won't go through all these because we won't have a ton of time, but questions you'll probably want to consider and talk to when you're thinking about procuring a certain type of product or device is whether or not they have a coordinated disclosure policy. What this means is if a security researcher, white hat hacker, finds an issue with the product, does that manufacturer work with the person and patch the issue or largely do they sue them and have a more adversarial relationship? In case it's not totally clear, you definitely wanna work with security researchers in a structured and thoughtful way and coordinated disclosure policies are ways to do that. Um, almost every tech company has one. Uh, a lot of the more forward thinking medical device companies have started to develop one, but they're still learning to bring them in. Thinking through how those organizations publish security updates um, and have support over time. And then also thinking through a software bill of materials. Happy to share more data. The short way to think about a software bill of materials is no software developers today build anything from scratch, nor should you. You do not wanna roll your own encryption. You wanna use standard protocols. And so you can think about it like a list of ingredients that's in your software. And if you have a vulnerability in one of those 
pieces of, of those ingredients, you could have a vulnerability in your whole product. And so being able to track all of the different software components of the products that you build is, is critical. Second is around data rights and governance. So the way I think about security is security is an unauthorized attack on a system. Things like Cambridge Analytica was not an attack on Facebook. That was a feature, not a bug, where Facebook was sharing data, perhaps in a way that some of the parties were not thinking about them being used. And so this can happen with any of the products that you're using. So really thinking through what are in your privacy policies, what's in your end user license agreements, how are these different types of data that are collecting digital specimens from your patients getting used. And one of the big issues that we have today is there are really good protections in our regulatory policy and other frameworks around biospecimens, but there are not great protections for digital specimens. If I cough, if I use one of these products, and you can collect a lot of signals on people, which is why it's very exciting from a clinical perspective, but there are also data issues to think about. And you'll note that I do not call this privacy, and I do that intentionally because in many instances, you might actually not want privacy. If I'm really sick, I might want my data shared. And so the terms that a lot of people really think about using is data rights and getting access to that data, which might mean more interoperability. Um, and in some instances, it might mean more privacy. And this, um, we can talk more about this, but then there's a much longer conversation than what I'll be able to do. But effectively, there is really no way to anonymize the level of data that you will collect from sensors, largely. I'm uniquely identifiable with 30 seconds of walk data. So this is why really thinking through who gets access to your data and when is extremely important. These are a couple questions you might want to ask when you're doing a procurement process around the data rights. So thinking about end user license agreements, privacy policies, whether or not these policy documents are comprehensive across all the products or just for certain products, whether or not they're readable. Uh, Think about the last time you've read a privacy policy. <laughs> Not all of us are lawyers, so thinking about how much it's understandable and what um, level of uh, readability. So often that can be through a fleisch kincaid score um, for people. All right, third is usability and utility. And the way I think about this is usability and utility are, as you add them together, it's whether or not the product is useful. So utility, is whether or not the product has the features that you need. And then usability and is how easy and pleasant those are to use. And so in many instances, especially in healthcare, we often pick things that have high utility but not have high usability. And in some instances that might be okay because you just really need to collect a feature or you need to collect a signal and you try it and it might not be as usable as you want. Um, it's not, always that great to just have something that's usable that doesn't have the utility that you need. And so this can be a, a, a lot of things, but it might be battery life, it might be whether or not it's water resistant, interoperability, um, it might be whether or not the product looks like a prison bracelet and whether someone would wear it outside if they can even go outside. And then the final one is around economic feasibility. And this is particularly important in software because in many instances, this is not a one-time purchase, especially because of security issues and other things where you'll have to patch things over time. And maybe the way you're doing the analytics, your costs and um, net impact of using that product can shift. And so um, learning more about how that product prices itself and what your overall cost would be to maintain it is important. And so here's some questions and the links are all available for you to think about this during procurement. So the way that I like to think about this is, it, in my opinion, doesn't really make sense to score a connect, piece of connected tech. So you would never ask somebody, what's the best drug or what's the best food? You would say, what does the drug need to do or what do I need from this food? And so one of the things that our society has built to look at these more complex decisions is we have drug labels, we have food labels, it might make sense to really think through a connected sensor label. And so that might look like, in some instances, you wanna 
go up on security, or maybe you can be a little bit more lax on the data rights as long as it has high utility and that you're able to intentionally decide how you're making these decisions across the products. And so it's also really helpful to think through as you're going through it to create these sorts of labels, in my opinion. And so you can really have a discussion with all the different stakeholders because there might be certain products that maybe a patient wants to wear more, but maybe your engineering team needs something and your legal team needs something. And being intentional about these decisions is an important process. There's a lot here. Um, and I'm very excited to let everyone know that we um, have been putting together, uh, we being a, a number of people from the Digital Medicine Society, former FDA, across a number of different healthcare companies and pharma companies have put together a basics on digital medicine. Um, we tried to make it fun. There's some graphics and cartoons and it launched on Amazon today. Um, the online version is free. And if you wanna get a physical copy of the book, uh, you can do that and both of those on carger.com. Okay, that's all I have. Adam, should we open it up for questions? Are we gonna have John do a, a little recap before um, questions? Uh, Adam, I'll defer to you on that. Okay. John, let me pose a question to you. And if you want to add any wrap up comments as well, that's, that would be great. Um, we've talked a lot today about how to react to the challenges of the current situation, which is of course appropriate and top of mind for everyone. In the past, I've heard you talk about some of the potential upside benefits that we could see from developing this sense of deep phenotyping of patients. That is having a lot more rich data um, from the real world. Is that something you could elaborate on a little bit for us in terms of some of the benefits we might actually see um, from different kinds of continuous monitoring? Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Um, thank, thanks, Chris, for, for that question. Uh, you know, so, so first of all, just, just kind of bringing the, the, the strands to, together of, of what um, uh, Elena and, and Andy uh, talked about, um, as well as, as where I started off. Uh, right, right, right now, uh, I, I think we would all agree that that all aspects of life have have uh, changed um, during this uh, pandemic, and uh, uh, particularly severely impacted our our clinical uh, trials. Um, in in addition, we we we, um, we we definitely have a, a number of regulatory guidances that have just become available um, that that support the conduct of clinical trials during this 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 pandemic. And uh, adopting remote monitoring, uh, virtual trials, at-home assess assessments, is are among the things that that have been in encouraged uh, by by regulators, and also require uh, um, some some technology tools. Um, assessing those tools as to whether they fit the intended purpose or or, or not is is uh, is critical and we we need to select the right devices ensure patient compliance and and uh, uh, clinical utility um, and and measurements that are routinely included uh, as parts of safety assessment in clinical trials including body temperature and heart rate uh, um, are, are can all be uh, components uh, that, that are uh, um, amenable to, to these kinds of technology assessments with, uh, with, with, with solutions at the, at the ready right, right, right now. Um, so I, I, I think that, that, um, that the subject of, of this uh, webinar has mostly been focused on reacting um, to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, but as Chris said, uh, um, there's, there's a completely different component um, here where we can get um, a, a, a really a more holistic picture of, of what is going on with our patients in, in clinical trials. And, and Andy showed you the, the slide from, um, from, from Evidation that is, is really nicely illustrative of we're only getting a small snapshot of, of what happens um, to, to patients in our clinical trials if we're only measuring, for example, vital signs at these uh, distinct time points. We, uh, we can get a much richer and more accurate uh, uh, appraisal of, of patients by um, using uh, wearable and other uh, digital monitoring devices uh, to, um, 
uh, to assess our, our, our patients. And, and that's where uh, Chris was going along the lines of, of uh, deep phenotyping to, to really get a better characterization, a, a more complete characterization of, of patients. We, we can use some of these, these technologies. Thanks, John. Um, Elena, I believe there's another question in chat. Maybe you could take a crack at this one. Sure. Um, so the next question is, uh, where do the panelists see the biggest opportunities for digital adoption as a result of the pandemic? Where can digital help most uh, with regard to clinical trial continuity in an overwhelmed healthcare system? This is a really uh, good question. And um, in my opinion, the world in the future is going to be before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. And right now we are in, in this transition state. The biggest opportunity I see is much bigger spread and adoption of digital technology. It's beyond a few pilot studies that we are know of. I expect much bigger leveraging adoption getting used, getting comfortable with the, these devices and see how the data shapes up. It's a potential huge upside for the clinical trials in the future once we are over the hump with the pandemic because it will demonstrate very broadly of what actually can be done beyond a few pilot experiments and people will be finally comfortable doing a lot of things remotely, which in my opinion can speed up clinical trials a great deal. Um, going back to one of the examples that I had shown in my presentation um, concerning the mobile spirometry, we've done a collaboration with University of Manchester and one of our sponsors, Regeneron, to do daily measurements of FEV1 in patients with asthma. In addition to uh, the concordance and feasibility of the study, what we have seen is greatly increased power of uh, clinical studies because when you do multiple repeat measurements, it gives you much more complete picture of how the disease condition behaves over the time. And it also increases the degrees of freedom. That means A, you can get to the same conclusion with a smaller amount of clinical study participants. And you also can adjust for covariates such as time of the day or allergy season that gives you too much more accurate answer whether an experimental drug is efficacious or not. Thanks, Elena and Rachel Craig. Thank you for that. For that one. Sorry. Oh. I have I was, a possible answer thank, for that Thank one. you, Rachel, for that question. Okay. And actually, I was going to ask you a question, Andy, but go ahead if you have a comment. And, and then I have a yeah. question for you as well. Perfect. Um, first of all, thanks, Rachel, for joining. Um, she's a friend, too. Rachel, I think probably three broad ways at remote monitoring. So one is largely what we're talking about today, which is supporting clinical research. I just added this in the chat. Second is around supporting telehealth in broadly. And then third is monitoring a population for... Um, COVID-related symptoms, so that would be more public health surveillance related. And then if you take the first one around clinical research, there's broadly two ways, um, which, which I think Elena had, um, kind of said before, but my brain works in like frameworks a little bit more. So for the first one around supporting research, one way is shifting existing trials to more virtual um, since people are at home. And then the second way is supporting new research for maybe COVID-19 vaccines and therapies within the clinical trials and shifting virtual visits. I largely think about um, like the different types of, so spirometers are really pretty good to shift over to digital. A lot of vital signs um, are pretty well understood that can be shifting over to digital, digital. And then things like accelerometers and gyroscopes are pretty well understood. So activity and motion are also candidates to be able to shift over to digital. And so, when I think about decentralized clinical trials, there's um, uh, 
Craig Lepsick also often talks about having a lot of hybrid trials. So it's not that everything has to go fully virtual, but you just want to minimize the amount of visits that someone might have at the clinic. And so thinking about what endpoints or measurements you might be able to collect at home to have as few site visits is important. And so activity vital signs are generally ones that are good candidates to shift over. Andy, one other thing I was going to ask you to comment on, I, we have a couple minutes left. Um, and, and of course, we will be sending um, materials and follow up to this to all the participants. Um, Andy, we, we agree, I think that that uh, it's important to recognize, as you pointed out, we don't need five 10K cleared devices to be part of every clinical trial. Um, at the same time, we've discussed the fact that there may be some overhyping and over promoting of the potential of, of consumer devices in broad distribution. I wonder if you could share a couple of thoughts on where we need to be a, a little bit more appropriately cautious and skeptical. Sure, thank you. Um, I think one of the challenging things is like, what really is the difference between a consumer device and a medical device? And like, it, where does that line get drawn? Because what's happening is a lot of what were consumer devices all of a sudden become medical devices because, quote, FDA has, you know, made it a medical device. Um, one of the big challenges is with the predicate system, you don't actually have to often share a lot of clinical data. So the weird dichotomy is that there are some instances where you might have a non-FDA cleared product that has far better evidence. It's been published in good papers. You can really look at it and understand that it's a quality product. Um, and a 510K product might not be that good. So the biggest thing that you'll want to ask for is around verification, analytical validation, clinical validation, and ask what is the type of evidence that they have for what they're doing. Where I would definitely be very skeptical is I get very nervous around data rights and how people are sharing the data, how they're storing the data. And a lot of times people ask questions that are very much about compliance, like, did you do 21 CFR part 11? Or do you have high trust? Or do you have these checkbox things? And what's happening in, in the security community is just that um, security is very different from compliance and really thinking about like, what are the security aspects for it? And if anyone ever tells you that the data is anonymous, like either they're lying to you or they do not know what that means. And so none of this data, especially when you're collecting streams of data is anonymous. And so you should be very skeptical on that and just really understand who gets access and when at what part of the chain. I'd ask you though, Chris, the same thing because you think about this all the time. What would you tell people? You know, I, 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 would, I would say that, um, you know, my closing comment on that as we come up against the hour is, you know, the statistics and math matter. Um, we, we need to be conscious of, of kind of the, the level of, of rigor associated with um, the analysis plans uh, that demonstrate what these, what these products can actually do and, and really expect that anything that we're looking at in a clinical trial setting, um, we, there's no reason to suspend the, the standard judgment that we would normally have in drug development just because there's an interesting looking technology. And I think that that's uh, often one of the sort of scary reactions that I, that I see when I, when I talk with sponsors. Um, recognizing the clock, I really want to thank the three of you, uh, John, Andy, and Elena, for making the time. Your, your talks were fantastic. Um, thank you all for participating. We will be sending out follow up to everyone um, with links to materials that were referenced in this discussion. So um, thank you again, stay safe, stay at home and stay well. And I look forward to being in touch with all of you. Thanks, Chris, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.